have been uh, working on a series called Multiply for several weeks, and, and just I want to kind of touch base with you on it to, to remind you why we did, how we started this series. It wasn't just to have a sermon series, but it was, was aimed at helping us to begin fulfilling the mission God has given us to go out and make disciples. And one of the things we often hear as we think about that process is, well, I just, I, I don't know enough. Well, number one, you do know enough. You know that Jesus loved you and died on a cross for you, and, and there's that option. But, but this is a uh, series that hopefully helps you have an understanding of what God is doing and what God has done that you can go on and share this with someone else. Don't, don't let it stop here. Uh, as we work through understanding the Old Testament, don't let it stop here. Help, let it help you go out and share what the Old Testament's all about with other people. And uh, we've been working on it for several weeks. Before Easter, uh, we, we started in Genesis 1. We're just kind of hitting some high points in the Old Testament. We started Genesis 1 as we talked about God creating all things and what that means. And, and then uh, after a couple weeks of uh, other things, we came back last week and looked at Genesis 3 at the fall, Adam and Eve, and that decision they made in the garden to, to disobey God, and, and the introduction of sin into our world, and, and the tragedy and consequences that we deal with on a daily basis. It explains a lot about the life we live here. But in the midst of all that, we also reminded of God's grace, God's mercy, and God's plan to, to fix it all by promising a seed, a, a descendant of Adam and Eve who would come and utterly and completely defeat Satan and remedy the problem of sin in our lives. Uh, we're going to skip ahead a few hundred years. And we're going to pick up with the, the relationship between Abraham and, and, and God. Abraham is probably the next big character or big individual in the story of the Old Testament. And, and in between Genesis 3 and Genesis 12, there's a lot of things that, that happen that, that, uh, that remind us of how sinful man is. Genesis 4, we find the first murder, Cain killing his brother Abel. Uh, Genesis 6, we find the, the story of how man became so sinful that, that God had reached the point of saying, I'm sorry that I made man and decided to take eight people in a boat with some animals and cleanse the earth and start over again. Genesis 11, we have the story of Babel where the descendants of man come and they begin building a tower and God says, you know, we, nothing will be impossible if we don't do something, so he confused the languages and the nations are scattered. Genesis 12, the story of Abraham, if you really want to read the whole story, Genesis 12 through 25. Uh, today we're going to focus in on three chapters because we want to really focus in on the covenant relationship between Abraham and God. And, and hopefully as we go through this you'll understand a little bit more about what covenants are. Uh, they are important Throughout the Bible, we find God works with man on the basis of covenants. Um, just it, it to, to give you a, a brief outline of what covenant is, if, you want, if you're ever curious, a, a covenant always has parties, people that are involved. And in relationship to biblical covenants, it's always God and man. There are the, con the promises that God gives and there are the conditions for receiving those promises. Those three things always are in every covenant you find. Uh, difference between biblical covenant is they are always instituted by God. There, man never comes to God and say, tell you what I'll do, God. God says, I'll tell you what I'll do if. And so the first major covenant we find in Scripture is the one between Abraham and uh, God. And so we're going to pick up with chapter 12. Uh, we're going to look at three different aspects. If, as we look through this, uh, uh, my outline today is, is basically three things. We're going to see in chapter 12 the covenant established. In chapter 15, we're going to see the covenant sealed. And in chapter 17, you're going to see the covenant confirmed. So let's start with chapter 12. It opens, it, it's almost 
anticlimactic the way it begins. If you read verse 1, it says, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. Now, if you go back to chapter 11, he uses the past tense. Abraham, he had, had said to Abraham, Leave your country. It's almost like it took place sometime in, in the past, but Abram hadn't quite got there yet. And if you go back to chapter 11, you'll find that uh, Abraham's father, Terah, had taken his family to a place called Haran and had uh, set up camp there. And then chapter 12, he opens up and he said, I had told Abram to follow me to a land I'll show you, uh, to go to Canaan. Now, the first question I have is, is why Abram? What was there about Abram that, that set him apart? And we don't know. It, it just simply says, God told Abram. And he makes his covenant with him. He gives him seven promises. Verse 2, I'll make you into a great nation. I think I have these up here. Basically, he says, Abram, you're my man. These are, so, sorry, six promises. I'll make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I'll curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That are the, those are the promises God makes to Abram. If you'll follow me. If you'll pack up everything and follow me to a land that I'm not telling you where it is. If you'll just follow me, these are the blessings you're going to have. How would you respond in a situation like that? It, and it amazes me as I look at the text in verse 4, it opens with these three words. So Abram left. C can you imagine that? Guys, can you imagine that? Going home after church today and going to your wife and saying, hey, I just got a message from God. We're packing up and we're moving to McMinnville. How's your wife going to take that? Abram goes to Sarah and says, hey, I just had a message from God. We're packing up and we're moving. And she goes, where to? I don't know. God's going to show us. She was a whole lot more submissive than most wives are today, I tell you. But that's Abram's faith. He says, I believe you, God, and I'm going to follow you. I'm going to go with you. And, and it's an amazing story. It's an amazing reality that God, Abram just simply believed God and followed him. And it goes on in that chapter to talk about the fact that he was 75 years old when he started out. How many 75-year-olds we have here today? You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> Imagine being 75 years old and moving to a place you don't even know where you're going. And walking. And walking. And he just took it and left. And then in verse 7, he says, The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I'll give, you, I'll give this land. I'll give you this whole land for yourself. There's a significance in there. In verse 7, it uses the word offspring. It is a singular word. It's not to your offsprings. It's not to all your descendants. It is to your offspring. I will give this land. And Paul says that fulfilled in Galatians 3.16. He says when he talks about seed or offspring, he is talking about Jesus Christ. So here we find the very first promise through Abraham that the Savior, the Messiah of all the world, will come through you. It's your offspring, it's your descendant who will be the hope. And then chapter 12 kind of ends that way. Abram responds by faith and did as the Lord had told him. 
Folks, that's really what God's looking for us, from us. If you think about it, that's the essence of the Christian life. In Jesus Christ, God says, come, follow me to a land I will show you. Anybody know where we're going? Anybody know how to get there? Anybody know what's going to happen along the way? And yet God says, follow me and I'll take you to a land that's full of blessing. And what's he want from us? To just simply go. Just as he tells us. The covenant's established by Abram's faith. Well, let's go on. So, we wait a few years. About nine years. Genesis 15 opens up nine years later. There's been, as far as we know, no communication between God and Abraham in that time. And so nine years, God comes to Abram in a vision. Why now? Why at that particular moment in time? Here's, here's my theory, and, and, and I'm going to show you why that's my theory. I, I theorize that he comes to him at that time because Abraham is having a crisis of faith. He is coming to Abram because Abram is sitting back and saying, it's been nine years. I don't have a child yet. God promised nine years ago that I would have a descendant, that I would become a great nation, and it's just not happening. And so God comes at this time because Abram needed some encouragement. He needed to have those fears allayed and put to rest and so that's why, if you, my cue is in verse 1, when he says, Do not be afraid, Abram. Don't be anxious. Don't stress out about it. Anybody here ever struggle with doubts about God's promises? You ever come to that place, you, oh, it's been so long, God promised it, it hasn't happened yet. It gives me great comfort to know that Abram, struggled with faith because he is the father of all faith he's the guy in the scriptures held up this is the example of faith and here he is with questions and we find him expressed in two ways verse 2 God introduces himself and Abram said O sovereign Lord what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my state is Eleazar of Damascus do you hear the doubt do you hear the doubt in that voice, that question? What can, I, what can I expect? What do I expect you to give me? Because so far, yeah, there's nothing. And then you go down to verse 8, follow up, because God comes to this place and says, I'm going to give you this land. And listen to the question in verse 8. You want to put it simply? How do I know? What guarantee do I have that you're going to do what you said you would do? Anybody ever struggle with those questions? And so God comes, and, and the fact that God comes and deals with him and does these things for him reminds me that the one thing God wants for you more than anything else is to help you believe he doesn't want you struggling with doubt. He is going to come and he's going to give you the evidence. He's going to work in your life so you can live confidently. And so he gives Abram three assurances. He assures him through his identity. Notice in verse 1. Do not be afraid, Abram. And he identifies himself. I am your shield. Now that's a tough question. What's the purpose of a shield? protection. I am your covering. I'm the one who's going to protect you. There, you can also take that word shield and translate it sovereign. I am your ruler. And that reminds me that the role of every ruler is to protect those who are his subjects. Why do we have government officials? Ideally to protect us. To be a covering for us. So if a ruler is not doing that, he's not fulfilling his God-given position. But I'm also your very great reward. Two things. 
Number one, he could be telling Abram, my relationship with you is the greatest treasure you will ever have. I am the reward. Folks, the greatest treasure you will ever have is that personal relationship with God. Amen? But the second thing is, I am your great reward. I'm going to do what I promised. And what I give you will be worth more than anything this world will ever, ever offer you. Do you struggle with doubts in your faith? First thing I want to encourage you to do to deal with those doubts is to go back and remember who God is. Go back and remind yourself who God is. He is our shield. He is our great reward. And we're going to find another name given in a little bit. But remind ourselves of who God is. But the second assurance he gives him is by repeating the promise. Notice that. Abram says, how do I know? I haven't got a descendant yet. So God repeats the promise. He says, the man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars. If indeed you can count on them, or if you can count them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And then we have that amazing statement. Abram believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Haven't got a child yet. Well, Abram, you're going to have children as many as the stars. And Abram believed. Okay, I'm good. I wish I could believe God that easily. I wish I could take God's word at face value instead of asking questions, instead of wanting to know the details. In Romans 4, 23 through 25, Paul tells us those words spoken here were not for Abraham's benefit, but for ours. So they were spoken for us so that we would remember that faith, committing ourselves to God and obeying Him, is the means for righteousness. So he prom the promise is repeated, and he tells him, I'll give you this land and then we have the second question, how can I know for sure? It's interesting. I'll believe you, you're going to give me descendants as great as the stars in heaven, but I'm not so sure about giving me this land. And so God makes an oath. Kind of a strange setup here. Look at what he tells, verse 9. So the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds, that the, then birds of prey came down in the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. Now, if that isn't weird to you, I don't know what is. God says, okay, you still doubt me? Here's what we'll do. I want you to go get a heifer. That, those of you who aren't farm people, a heifer is a young cow, hasn't had a calf yet. Go get a goat, bring them here, and then Abram cuts them in half. Somebody said, well, is that long ways or? It don't matter. Cuts them in half, separates the parts, and all the blood flows between them. It's strange to us. But folks, this is the way every covenant and contract was sealed in the Old Testament. This is, if you will, the signing of the contract. I am signing my name, and, and by doing this, it's saying, if I don't do what I say I will do, may I be cursed like these animals. May what happened to these animals happen to me. So God says, okay, you want assurance? I'm willing to sign a contract. But before he does it, he lays out the conditions. He tells Abram what's going to happen. He even tells him things off in the future. He, and, and so it says, a dreadful, a dark sleep fell over Abram. That's the kind of sleep that fell on Adam when God took his rib. And God came to him and said, okay, here's, here's the plan. Your descendants, those as numerous as the stars, they're, 
they're going to, to live and they're going to end up in a land not their own and they're going to be enslaved for 400 years. And then they're going to come back and this land is going to be theirs. That's what's going to happen. And then, it says, after it was dark, in a vision, Abram sees a smoking fire pot and a torch. Representation of God. So what happens? What, what happens with a smoking fire pot and torch? He walks between the animals. Now, in most covenants, when I, if, if I were to make a covenant between Ron and I in that day, both of us, because it was dependent on both of us, would walk through that blood. The fact that God passes through that blood alone says this is all on me. It's not going to depend on your faithfulness. It's not going to depend on, on your descendants being faithful to me. I am going to accomplish what I say I will do. And certainly, as we look at the Old Testament, we know God's dealing with Israel was never based on their faithfulness. God says, I'm going to do it. And God passes between the animals. And verse 18 simply says, on that day, God made a covenant with Abram. Sealed, signed, delivered. And Abram says, okay, we're good. So it's sealed. So now we wait another 13 years. Obviously, God, Abram continues living by faith. 13 years, he's 99 years old. Still no child. Well, they have a child. He's 13. Ishmael by name. Ishmael was the uh, result of Sarah's great plan. It's always the woman. You notice that? It's always the woman. I, Sarah comes to Abram and says, we don't have a child yet. So here, here's what the plan is. You, you see my handmaid, that really good looking woman over there, Hagar? Why don't you go sleep with her? She can be a surrogate and give us a child. How many of you know that's a bad plan from the very beginning? <laughs> Guys, this is not going to work out. But Abram, okay. <laughs> Guys, we're stupid. Abram does what his wife tells him to do. Didn't enjoy a minute of it. <laughs> and Ishmael is born. It's destined to be bad from the very beginning. And it turns out that way. It, it just turns out Sarah begins to really give her grief and him grief for the fact that he slept with Hagar. Thirteen years. God comes again. I don't know why it's 13 years. Maybe he was upset with them, the fact that they took it in their own hands to try and figure this out and work it out. But 13 years later, God shows up again. Chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. A new name. This name has never appeared in Scripture to this point. El Shaddai, the God for whom nothing is too hard, the God for whom, who is able to do the impossible, because he is talking about impossible things, he's talking about taking a 99 year old man and a 90 plus year old woman and giving them a child, if that ain't impossible there ain't nothing that is. But I want you to know I'm confirming it by the fact of who I am. Remember what I said earlier? Remember who God is? Take care of the doubts by remembering who God is. The God who is able to do the impossible. If it sounds too good to believe that God promises you to do these things, remember who God is. I am God Almighty. Walk before me. 
and be holy or blameless. Just follow me. There's those conditions again. And he says, if and I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. The first confirmation is his identity. He also confirms it by changing their names. Abram, which meant exalted father, is changed to Abraham, which becomes the father of many. Now, Fred and I were talking about that this week. Imagine, God comes, you don't have any children yet, except for Ishmael. God hasn't given you a child yet, and he comes, and what kind of sense of humor does God have to say, Abram, your name's going to be Abraham, father of many. Imagine going to uh, a business meeting and saying, yeah, I'm Abraham, father of many. First question out of their mouth is, how many kids you have? One. It doesn't quite match up. But he's confirming, by giving him that name, he's confirming, this is what I'm going to do. And then he changes Sarah's name, which, Sarah, contentious. That suggest anything about their home life? Her name meant contentious, argumentative. And he changes it to Sarah, many nations. Some translations say, princess. Mm. Now we know. Now we know why women think the way they do about themselves. But this confirmation, this is what I'm going to do. You don't have any children yet, but I'm going to give you many. You're going to be the, the source of nations and kings and rulers, and these names are my confirmation and my reminder of that. And then he gives them one other. Let's all say, Yahoo! <laughs> Verse 9. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. He gives him no new promises, but he does now extend it to his descendants. And this is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision. It will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And if anybody doesn't know what circumcision is, talk to me afterwards. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. This step is Abram's ability and opportunity to confirm his commitment to the covenant. God has confirmed it through his name, has confirmed it through changing of names, and now it's time for Abram to step up. Now Abraham to step up and confirm his commitment. And brother, it takes commitment to do what God asks him to do. 99 years old. And what's Abram do? Get circumcised. I promise I'm going to do. I promise my life and those of my descendants will be committed to your covenant. And every, don't take this wrong, every day there wasn't a male in Abram's ancestry that didn't see that mark in their body that said, I am a child of the covenant. I live for that covenant between me and God. It was a constant reminder, a confirmation that we live under that covenant promise. I want to take a moment because there's some parallels. New Testament makes some parallels between circumcision and baptism. If you go to Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, he uses that image as he talks about baptism. He says, a circumcision done not by the hands of men, but by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him. What does that mean? These waters of baptism, when I submit myself to the water of baptism, I am confirming my willingness to accept 
the terms of the covenant. It's this act that reminds me of my commitment. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22, Peter takes that and, and uses another word. He says a pledge of good conscience. In the New Testament, that word is tantamount to signing the contract. That was, it's what took place when two men sat down or two individuals sat down and negotiated a deal. And at some point, the one being offered the deal would stand up and say, I accept the terms of the agreement and they would shake hands. Peter uses that imagery to suggest that it's at baptism that we are shaking hands with God and saying, I accept the deal. I am committing myself to following that covenant conditions and I accept the promises you've given to me. So there is that commitment. There is that confirmation. And if you will, oops, get you to the next song. And if you'll think about that, the act of baptism is significant. There are a lot of people who make it insignificant, who say it doesn't mean a whole lot. And I don't want you to, I don't want you to leave here today saying that baptism saves me. It is an element. It is a response of my faith that says I believe what God said and God has asked me to willingly commit myself to that and baptism is a part in which I physically sign the agreement and receive the benefits of the blessings. And through all of this, the message is simply that God tells Abram, you are the one. You are the one through whom I'm going to bless all the nations. Abram is, the, is one of the reasons why we are here today. Because God brought his descendants down through the generations and brought Jesus into the world. Jesus died on a cross for all mankind. And because we are here today living by faith, we have the hope and the promises of his covenant. I want to share some words from Francis Chan's book, Multiply. They're not in, I took them out of order because they seem to fit better to me. It says, through Abram, or Abraham, God set in motion his plan to redeem the world by creating a people for himself. And ultimately, he would send his son Jesus Christ, Abraham's descendant, to set the world to rights. Abraham lived some 4,000 years before Jesus came to earth, but was declared righteous because he believed what God said about what he would do through his descendant, Jesus Christ. We are living some 2,000 years after Jesus came to earth, but we are declared righteous when we believe what God says about what he has God done through Abraham's descendant, Jesus Christ. Abraham was credited righteous by his faith and trust in God. We are credited as righteous through our faith and trust in the work done by Jesus on the cross. I guess I just want to ask one question. Have you been credited with righteousness? Are you standing today as a righteous and holy, acceptable person before God through Jesus? The opportunity is there. Jesus Christ came, sealed. We participated in the emblems of the bread and the juice to remind us that Jesus came and established a covenant with the body and the blood. The essentials for every covenant. And through that promised us forgiveness of sin. Promised to us the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide us and to teach us and to lead us. To give us the promise of an eternal home with God for eternity. And the ability to stand before God boldly and confidently.
And the opportunity to enter into that covenant relationship exists even today through faith. And we want to offer you that opportunity. We've got water in the baptistry. And there may be one here today who wants to sign that contract. Because I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that he's the only means for my salvation. I believe that I want to live for him from here on out in a way that's obedient to his commands. And we want to give you that opportunity. Because God wants to bless your life. Will you listen? Will you let him guide you through that? In the morning 